Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining to this uh, last session of the day. I know it's been a packed day, but uh, thank you, everyone, uh, here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the discoverability of digital public goods. Uh, thank you for the people also joining online. Please uh, ask any questions through the chat. We have a moderator here, and we will uh, try to answer uh, as many as we can. And yeah, with that, I think we can start. So uh, first of all, uh, a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Ricardo Miron. I'm the technical lead at the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative endorsed by the UN uh, with the goal of uh, attaining the sustainable development goals by increasing the discoverability, use, and investment on open source technologies. Uh, there are multiple organizations uh, that are part of this alliance, uh, including uh, the UN system, but also uh, donors, uh, civil society organizations, private companies, and governments, uh, including GitHub, of course, who's co-hosting this, this session. Um, and to start a little bit with this conversation, I want to put a quick example of what digital public goods are and the value they create. Uh, this is a common example we always uh, use, but it's a really good one. Uh, starting uh, the pandemic in 2019, uh, a lot of the governments facing a lot of challenges throughout the different uh, logistics of uh, trying to resolve for uh, vaccines and uh, uh, contact tracing and different stuff, right? So this is the case of uh, Sri Lanka, a small country that uh, after uh, two or three days of detecting the first case of COVID-19 in the country, they started developing uh, an app, basically a COVID-19 tracker, and uh, they did it at a really fast scale and in a really quick manner because this COVID-19 tracker was built on top of uh, something called DHIS2, which is a digital healthcare information system, and it's the backbone of many digital healthcare systems in the world. So they didn't start from scratch, but they basically used this and built it on top of it. Uh, it got quickly deployed uh, at airports, hospitals, and other public spaces, and they released it under an open source uh, code. So basically, it was able to be reused by many other countries. And uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, it was because it was based in other open source uh, solution called DHIS2, and uh, you can see here in the map uh, the different countries that have adopted this COVID-19 tracker that was developed in Sri Lanka. And this was possible, of course, because the code was available, but also because other um, conditions that I'll talk a little bit more about. But if you notice something in this map, is that there's like a clear line of where this uh, uh, COVID-19 tracker was adopted, and that's not a coincidence. Um, the only small country that you see up there is Norway, but that's because DHIS2 uh, was developed by the University of Oslo and is still maintained by the University of Oslo. But that speaks a little bit about the need to increase the use of certain open source technologies, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. Um, yeah. So yeah, talking about developing software anywhere in the world, um, GitHub. A little bit of background about what GitHub is and why we're here today at, and at IGF. So GitHub is a complete software developer platform for anybody to create software. So whether that is in the public sector, the social sector, private sector, civil society, um, they can then go on GitHub to build, scale, and deliver secure software. We have a number of software developers around the world, and they create software like digital public goods, such as DHIS2. And they use different tools, such as Copilot, which is an AI um, pair programmer to help um, uh, software developers write code faster. And it's one way where we can lower the barrier to programming for individuals that want to learn a new programming language or learn how to code. There are ways for them to do so with a pair programmer. And they don't need to pay for expensive boot camps, for instance. There's GitHub Actions, which automate 
ads, um, certain jobs to be run on GitHub, and there's a whole marketplace where other people can create tools and share them as part of an open source um, community. There's advanced security, there's also code spaces, which allows for um, developers to spin up a coding environment easily, and they can do so from any device. So if someone doesn't have a computer, for instance, they can use a different device to set up a development um, environment to start coding. So that's a little bit about GitHub. We're gonna then go into the next slide on what open source is and what open source means for the social sector. A little bit more background for anybody who's not familiar, open source refers to software, which co the source code is freely, freely available to the public. It allows um, anyone to use it, modify it, and then distribute it again. It means that software can be then improved and customized. Does anybody use um, Android, for instance, an Android phone? That's an open source a tool. Um, and so you already use open source maybe without knowing. And um, open source is important because you're able to then develop collaboratively with a community of other developers around the world. Now, open source in the social sector, this is defined as software that's built with relevance to the sustainable development goals. They do no harm by design, and it's driven to um, really increase transparency, accountability, as well as participation to really empower anybody who wants to create code to work together to address um, all the sustainable development goals, and which is how it fits in with the uh, digital public goods. I'm gonna hand it over to Ricardo to explain yeah. a little more. And GitHub is kind of the default platform that almost all open source projects use. And uh, I talked a little bit about DHIS2, which is on GitHub, but there are also other projects like uh, CCAN, which is the uh, world's largest open source open data portal and is used by many governments. There is also ERP Next, which is the world's uh, largest ERP uh, that's open source. And there's many ways that these uh, projects are available through GitHub and developers um, know the way on how to fork these projects, adapt them, uh, reuse them, and even contribute back through GitHub platform. But that's not the case for every single project. And uh, that's why a little bit of this discussion <laughs> focuses on how we make discoverable these other digital public goods that are not the world's largest open source something, right? So one of those examples is not only the open source software projects, but also open data, open content, open models, uh, and open standards, which are also digital public goods. Uh, one of those systems is Simple Map, which uses uh, computer vision for precision agriculture, and they basically uh, detect the different uh, uh, health status of different types of crops. Uh, there's also Open Terms Archive, which is a database of the different terms of service that different governments, uh, uh, private companies, and digital services have used and modified to give more transparency and accountability to the changes of those platforms. So those are also great digital public goods that are helping achieve certain uh, targets of different SDGs, but that are maybe not as well known as the other examples that we just mentioned. So uh, to kind of help make these projects more discoverable. Um, we created the DPG registry and the DPG standard, but something that I first want to mention is that all of these projects help solve a global need, even if it's uh, locally deployed or within a local context. Uh, any of these projects are relevant to the SDGs, so they could be replicated, and that's kind of also what open source and digital public goods try to achieve. Uh, are open by default, but it's not only that the code's available, but also the documentation and that anyone can contribute either through GitHub or through the different channels that they have. And that, of course, they're like officially recognized as uh, digital public goods. And we have uh, a set of criteria that uh, we use to vet these solutions and make sure that it's not only the license, so it's not only that's public and that there's uh, an open source license, but also that they have things like uh, great documentation, that they adhere to uh, laws and privacy and security best practices, that they use open standards, and that they do no harm by design. So in here, we also look at how their code of conduct for the contribution community works, or um, different things as uh, best practices for contributing, right? So that's part of what makes a digital public good. 
and we use this standard to evaluate the different uh, open source solutions that are out there and people can apply to be officially recognized as a digital public good. So they nominate through uh, our portal at digitalpublicgoods.net, then it goes through a, a technical review and if they pass all of the indicators, then they uh, get added to the registry. Uh, right now we have around 150 plus solutions, including, as I mentioned, not only software, but also content data models and standards uh, across all of the SDGs and all of the different sectors. Some of these solutions are more uh, specific use cases or sectorial, but also some others are more in the society-wide functions. And there's been a lot of talk here around digital public infrastructure and uh, the best way that we think to build digital public infrastructure is, is through digital public goods, such as uh, MOSIP, which uh, is also around here somewhere. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and this registry uh, gets updated uh, every year. Uh, we make a reassessment of all of the tools. And as I said, it's vetted against through the DPG standard and every single uh, solution that's in there gets uh, reviewed. So it's not only a list of the projects, but it's also something that, that's updated and that's uh, reviewed by a technical team. And this registry also fits into se several other detailed catalogs like uh, UNDP Digital X, which use these solutions as well for the long-term agreements, for example, with uh, UN country offices, but also, for example, for investments by uh, the Inter-American Development Bank. So there are many use cases why we want to make digital public goods discoverable. It's not only for the tech community to contribute or develop, right? So uh, this is one of the tools we use, but there are also other challenges that we might uh, want to highlight uh, with the discoverability. And yeah, so some policies to consider to help improve this discoverability of the tools. Um, we have here a couple on starting with public and private sector partnerships, being able to um, pull in a number of different private sector, public sector, academia to be able to work together on either um, highlighting these tools exist, this is how it's used, this is how to implement them. A lot of times, for instance, on GitHub, the implementation can be a little bit harder as they're very technical tools and the documentation is highly technical. Uh, so one thing we wanna work together on is being able to create a microsite to make it really easy for open source developers to pick up an issue that is related to a digital public good and the open source community can then work on that. So for example, if there's a bug on um, a certain app, any open source developer then can go and try and fix that bug and push that fix through for a digital public good. But we do need help from um, digital public goods as well with, for instance, on the metadata standards, making sure it's tagged properly so we can pull that into the microsite and encouraging more um, standardizing formats and tagging systems. And then this way we can create more long-term plans, having sustainability on these plans as a lot of times with the private sector, things change a little bit quicker. Um, every quarter, there sometimes is a different initiative and we want to make sure we have longer term plans in place. Being able to create a collaborative platform to make it really easy to share the digital goods. The registry is really great, but we want to make sure it's also accessible to um, other standards and other um, organizations that have their lists of digital public goods. Um, including that is creating a feedback and improvement loop so we can hear back from individuals that create digital public goods, that use digital public goods, and also fund digital public goods. A lot of times those are different groups, so being able to understand where they're coming from and being able to incorporate that back into um, GitHub, for instance, on how we host the digital public goods and how the um, individuals can find them is really important. On the next slide, we'll go into a little bit more um, on the public and private partnerships considerations. Um, they're very similar to the previous slide, of course, with highlighting transparency and accountability, being able to really showcase this is what this partnership means and this is what we will do on both sides. Um, and also on capacity building. A lot of times there is a little bit of a divide with the private sector. They may not fully understand the terms that are used um, within um, the social sector or the public sector. Being able to showcase this is a lot of times this is what the SDGs are and this is why it's important with the private sector. 
um, has been uh, sometimes a little bit learning curve for some uh, other partners, but they do understand the importance of SDGs. And furthermore, being able to align on the goals, being able to showcase this is how um, certain DPGs work, and this is why it's important, really help to align the goals to be able to make sure that we're really working towards the same thing for that long-term plan. And of course, having monitoring and evaluation impact reports. Uh, a lot of times, um, some private sector companies may not be used to creating uh, monitoring evaluation reports in certain ways. So being able to showcase this is what m and &E is, and this is how we can incorporate into that long-term plan really helps strengthen the, the partnership. And finally, on data and knowledge sharing, being able to share the data that comes through on DPGs on how it's being used, which regions are using it, and then sharing that across um, the partnership. Um, one that comes to mind is a World Bank Development Data Partnership, being able to share that data to be able to have more research and highlight areas where more DPGs are needed or where DPGs aren't well known, then we can work a little bit more in that section. And then finally, we have five simple rules. Hopefully these are the ones that you can remember um, on improving discoverability. The rule one is decide what level of access you can provide to your partners and how deep the, that par uh, access should be. Rule number two, deposit the DPGs in multiple trusted repositories for access, preservation, and reuse. So being able to have it in different areas, even though it may seem like it's repeating itself, it makes it easier for anybody to come across it. Rule number three, create thoughtful and rich metadata. So consider the FAIR data principles, which is making sure the data is findable, is accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And number four, localize the tools for cross-domain integration. So localization um, can appear in many different ways, whether that's by language, by um, software development languages, being able to have the tool um, be implemented easily for an organization that may not have very a large technical team, making it really easy that for them to implement is very important on discoverability. And then lastly, ensuring accessibility and inclusion for ease of access. So having a digital public good that's um, easy to access and the use of a design considers traditionally marginalized groups is important to improve discoverability as um, there may be groups that don't have access to um, certain connectivities. So if this DPG can work in low connectivity regions and also the systems are in multiple languages, it'll make it uh, increase the discoverability chances. Uh, and most importantly, to engage the community to be able to understand what type of tools they need, what are they currently using that it's not working or works really well, and understanding um, the accessibility on and including them in the accessibility journey as well. So those are the five rules that we have. And in this session, we want to have more of an interactive time. So we have some roundtable discussions that Ricardo will um, take away, and we want to hear from you. Yeah, a little bit of uh, what we want to hear from you is also like what are the use cases in your context that you could use uh, digital public goods. And it's not only because uh, you're necessarily interested in, in open source, but a lot of the discussions around digital transformation, either from governments or international development or private companies, uh, comes around uh, how uh, half of the world or the global south is going to uh, continue this journey and uh, just replicating the, the model uh, from the developed countries is not necessarily going to work the same here. So there's a necessity uh, to use digital public goods to help uh, some of these uh, digital transformation efforts. So uh, yeah, these are just a couple of getting questions and I want to encourage as well the people participating online to uh, put their comments, but I don't know if uh, someone from the public here uh, wants to answer any of these questions or something related to that. Like, what would be your use cases in terms of uh, open source? Hi, my name is Tarek Hassan. I'm the head of the Digital Transformation Center for the GIZ in Vietnam. Thank you so much for this session. I think this is an amazing showcase that DPGs can be an antithesis to the usually private sector driven deployment of technology. But I was also interested in that um, IBM, SAP, 
They offer solutions, but they also offer consulting services. So you spoke a lot about capacity, not coming with an answer, but more of a question from your practice on how do you see successful deployment usually being implemented? From my understanding, a lot of the institutions usually don't have the tech expertise in-house a lot of the times. And what's really attractive about private sector partners like IBM is that they, they come in and they have their uh, consultants who help you implement that in your system. So I was also wondering for the um, DPG Alliance, I understand that your team wouldn't have the capacity, of course, to consult public sector institutions around the world. But do you see, for example, consultancies, private sector consultancies who use DPGs in order to then consult public sector institutions around the world? Is that something that you would like to see? Or is your ideal scenario, so to speak, to see more DPGs being implemented by the institutions themselves rather than have a sort of economy built, consultancy economy built around DPGs? If that makes sense. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can uh, maybe talk a little bit around that. Uh, Question, I think uh, like having a strong community behind the digital public goods project is something that's key for implementation and successful deployment of these technologies. And uh, we talked about DHIS2, and uh, maybe I didn't mention this, but part of the success of the replication of the tracker that was developed is because there are many community hubs that focus around uh, DHIS2 that already have the technical knowledge and capacity to implement this. So that was crucial part of of this process, right? And that doesn't happen only uh, because you publish some code on, on certain place, right? So uh, that's one model, like build different communities. And uh, I don't think there's like a one way or one correct answer to, to that. But uh, there are others that have different models, like uh, validating different vendors that provide this technical assistance that you were talking about, right? So one of the other examples is XROAD, which is this uh, a data exchange open source solution developed by Estonia, which has uh, approved uh, vendors uh, around different places that help implement and provide this, right? Because XRO directly does not provide this service, but rather relies on this vendor ecosystem to uh, successfully deploy and uh, maintain the different uh, implementations of, of this solution. So I think it's definitely like a mix of different models that could be applied, but uh, yeah, I don't know if. if you wanna... Yeah, I'm the online moderator, but uh, since there's not much to moderate, <laughs> let me uh, jump in here as well. I'm also with the DPGA. I uh, lead on our work with countries uh, on AI. And uh, what you put forward is this idea to develop really a consultancy environment. That's actually what we try to inspire, uh, so to say. Um, because um, a lot of countries ask this actually, how can I develop my local vendor ecosystem uh, for digital public goods? And um, for countries that open source their technology, it's also, an, I mean, in their interest to build up this capacity locally, um, because for them it's, uh, it's a way to position themselves as a global leader uh, in um, digital transformation and digital public services. Um, so, for instance, the Togolese government developed Novisi, which is a payment system uh, which was uh, used and deployed during the COVID-19 pandemic to um, make cashless transfers uh, to uh, vulnerable people. And they have a great interest in building the capacity that other vendors can implement the system in other countries as well, and therefore also boost their soft power, uh, so to say. Um, but since we have Mosip here in the room, maybe uh, you guys also want to share a bit about your model and uh, what's working. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> Hi, this is Rohit from Mosip. Uh, we are a digital public good for identity based out of a uh, university in Bangalore, IIIT Bangalore. So the model that has worked for us is similar to what XROAD has done is that we have developed an ecosystem of vendors because we are a identity platform. And thus, there are two things that are required. One is that are biometric devices that are required for an identity platform to work. And the other thing is that there are SDKs and several other software you know, add-ons, you can say, to create the entire national ID system. So what we have done is that uh, we have 
created two sorts of, uh, you can say, partnerships. One we call with the system integrators, because those are those big, uh, you could say, software providers who would come and would create all the, the entire system. And the other thing that we do is that we have created a compliance program for software development kits, for biometric devices, and other things. And then we have been able to create a vibrant ecosystem of about 80 plus partners across the globe who are then, uh, you know, wherever these countries want to develop a national ID system, they can choose amongst these multiple vendors, avoiding any kind of vendor lock in or any kind of, uh, you know, consultancy trap, if I may use the term. Uh, but at the same time, they're able to provide the services through a capacity building program that MOSIP would have given. So all our SIs undergo a capacity building program where they have to prove that they understand the system and they are able to implement the system uh, for, for our engineers to you know, test that. So in that sense, uh, as of now, this program has worked well for us. And we have seen about three national rollouts that, that we are going through and about uh, 11 to 12 pilot, successful pilot that we have done. So I think that this, this is a model that, that has worked. This might not be the DHIS model, which, which is very community driven and very bottom up, you could say. Uh, this is not exactly the NIIS model or the X road model. It's, it has been called that it is that you have a set of vendors that, that you can only work with. We say any vendor can work with us. Any private entity can work with us. The only thing that we request is that you join our capacity building program. So then what happens is that we build capacity in the country, and we also build capacity at the private level. So that's why developing capacity is both the sides and creating this virtuous cycle. Hopefully, there, there will be a time when you don't need a triple ITV or most. If you can just go on GitHub, you have your SIs, you have your biometric partners, and countries can do the implementation themselves. So that's, that's our model. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think also um, on the capacity building side, there's one thing where um, DBGs, we want to encourage them to have a larger community and use the open source community. So trying to figure out ways um, on capacity building. We have a program to be able to train community managers for digital public goods, and then they will belong to the digital public good and maintain that community for open source um, developers that want to join. But I also would love to know what other capacity building opportunities or do you see any gaps in capacity building, um, how it's currently done, how it's run, that we can consider? Would love to know anybody's thoughts. Hi there, uh, Tim Steiner, uh, working in the field of digital transformation for GIZ Bangladesh. And to be honest, I sadly do not have any answer for you, but kind of like extending that question. Because from the ex examples that you have been shown, uh, for me at least it looked a lot like you would work with um, partners mostly on the national level. Uh, for us in GIZ Bangladesh, we are currently shifting from a national focus to a rather like local government focus and facing exactly the same problem, right? Like even on the national level, it's really hard to convince people to build up, let's say an ICT cell uh, for yeah, having, having people also sustaining the solutions over uh, a longer time. Um, so yeah, basically the question that I would like to respond, uh, to give back to you is if you're working on, on a local level, um, how do you do that? Or are you working on a local level? And if so, how do you do that if uh, let's say the national support is not really um, there? Thanks. Yeah, um, directly us at the DPA are maybe not uh, working at the local level, but many of these solutions and DPGs are. And uh, I can talk about one specific experience of uh, a project called Decidim, which uh, it's uh, for uh, partic digital participation of citizens. And that's a very kind of local topic that's implemented mostly at the city level. So what they do is that uh, they basically have as well kind of like a program that they use to kind of train uh, uh, officials on those cities to run the project, but also part of uh, like, and it's completely optional, of course, right? Because the solution is open source, so you could decide like any city government or organization can decide to directly just uh, pull the project and deploy them themselves. But if they want to uh, 
be part like in a partnership or collaboration where they get this extra added kind of capacity building the basically the agreement is that uh whoever is deploying the solution like if it's a vendor or whoever like gets a uh, part of uh uh, of yeah, of funding to the project, also to kind of give back, and in return they get this capacity building. So they're not necessarily charging specifically uh, for for that deployment, but that way they can still provide like a service to multiple uh, local uh, governments or or cities to have this extra capacity. And that's also kind of their sustainability model because this uh, tool originally was developed by a government and then kind of spin out into like a different foundation, but that also came with uh, the cost of not having like uh, sustainable uh, funding for them. So uh, yeah, I guess that that's one project that I can, uh, yeah, just highlight, like that's their model and that works very well at the local level where, where they have like a small incentive for uh, cities and governments to uh, collaborate with them and also creates back like a sustainability of yeah funding for for the project itself. Yeah, I think um, that's a very good example. It does go into the core on this discoverability issue, where one local city or local um, area may know of a tool, but maybe a partnering one just doesn't know how did they find out. And that's one thing where we hope that the five rules earlier could help um, encourage that, um, so more tools can be used widely. And we're looking for different ideas to promote the adoption of DPGs um, and integrate them into local e ecosystems effectively. Hi, thanks for this session. My name is Kay McGowan. I'm with the Digital Impact Alliance. And last year, we worked uh, very closely with the Digital Public Goods Alliance to steward an effort called the Digital Public Goods Charter that was meant to kind of lift up the opportunities, but also dig into some of the challenges around this and the systems integrators and the lack of um, folks that have the technical capacity certainly came up. But there, was, there were capacity issues on the software side too. Right? So we had, in particular, in our consultations with policymakers, whether at a municipal level or a, a national government, we kept hearing things about like the procurement processes don't allow for open source adoption, or they're already using systems that they're locked into and there's a lot of risk and cost associated with moving from one system to another. And so I guess I'm just wondering if you guys think about capacity are you looking at issues beyond just the technical capacity, which obviously needs a big work and more of the kind of whole package? Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, on our agenda. Um, so at the uh, DPGA's annual members meeting, we will, for instance, have a session around capacity development, which is tackling the three levels uh, of capacity development that you usually need in order to be successful. One is the individual, and we talked a lot about you know individual capacity development, so upskilling users, upskilling developers, upskilling specific vendors. And then, of course, the other part is the organizational capacity development. So what you say, procurement laws, for instance, what countries uh, need to do to upgrade is their ability to actually procure open source software and open source systems. And third part being at the societal level, so to really yeah, shape policies, shape the understanding of open source technology as a good that benefits society in, a, in an ideal case. And that's, for instance, a point that I, we hear a lot from countries as well, that uh, citizens are skeptical of open source software if they find out that their government is, is using any of these, because it's usually associated with being not secure and not safe uh, and so on and so forth. So there's this kind of capacity uh, development needed as well. Uh, so it's definitely, um, yeah, as I said, on our agenda. Of course, it's not an easy task. I mean, as a, like everyone who's working in international development knows, capacity development takes years and years. It's not that there's an easy fix. Um, but I think all of us play our different roles uh, in, in, this, uh, in this part. 
And uh, CityPGA, for instance, really en encourage sharing of knowledge, uh, of experiences, of good practices from the different levels that need to be involved uh, in, in such an endeavor. So, and that's why we put this topic on the agenda of our annual members meeting, for instance. Hi, um, I'm Swaratmika. I also work with MOSIP, and I just wanted to take Kim's question probably one step further. Um, we've been sitting in a lot of panels since this, since this morning, and I noticed that while capacity building comes up a lot and people say that it needs to be contextualized, um, there is a certain capacity that no one is really talking about in terms of how, how do you kind of ensure that the technology has the sociocultural relevance? Somebody in the morning very interestingly said that, you know, the technology needs to fit the society and not the other way around. Um, so I think there is definitely an opportunity here. I don't know if the DPG is working on it, but to kind of bring in a lot of interdisciplinary capacity into building this beyond just technology and policy, like this kind of an umbrella of things that fall between these two categories. So I was wondering if there's something there. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are many things that the projects are working on that kind of fall into this in between. And I can say that uh, it's probably not the case for everyone, but many of these open source projects are uh, digital commons or stored by a community model, which actually takes into account very much of, of this kind of capacity of the societal context that comes with it, right? And uh, we have some digital public goods that are stored by civic tech organizations, for example, where most of the focus is not actually on the technology, but on how you design the process and facilitate uh, development, uh, delivery of public services, right? Because if you're just trying to copy the same model of an existing physical public service into a digital tool is not necessarily something that's gonna work, but you gotta think in mind with what, uh, yeah, what can be improved, right? Not, not just putting it in the digital space. And I think many of the organizations behind the open source project are thinking more that way rather than just uh, trying to develop a tech tool for developing a tech tool. But yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific answer to that. Yeah, I think that's a very important question because it relates to this um, idea of bringing the public back into digital public goods. Uh, so a governance question, actually. And uh, as Ricardo mentioned, we see this uh, with some uh, DPGs, but not with all, to be honest. I mean, there are also DPGs that are developed in a top-down uh, manner. And I think that's especially true in, a, in, a, uh, in the DPI fields, in the digital public infrastructure fields. And here, for instance, we speak about uh, of MOSIP as a... DPG with DPI capabilities, and not to confuse uh, these two different things. And um, I think one good example on a, on a global and multilateral uh, level is the DPI safeguards initiative that the UN Tech Convoy uh, with UNDP just launched uh, recently, um, because that's the, uh, that's the um, uh, endeavor to develop a framework for safe and secure DPI, which uh, does so in the multi-stakeholder uh, consti uh, const um, in a multi stakeholder process um, where uh, you basically involve uh, everyone uh, that uh, wants to uh, add to the development of the framework. Um, and I think that's on a multilateral level a really good example, but I think we also need to break it down to the individual product and actually help developers to do exactly that, so bring back the public uh, into the debate, into the development process. So it looks like that is all the time we have. We don't want to be in the way for between you and the dinner. So the last um, closing comments that we have, this was a really great conversation, and we're always open for any other thoughts you have on discoverability. Um, we do have a couple other sessions, as you see here. One on October 10th, a quick lightning talk will be myself as well as Ricardo on combating misinformation with digital public goods. One thing to consider, misuse of tools, how do we tackle that? So come and join us on that quick talk on the 10th and we can continue the conversation there. And then we have an open forum um, that the Digital Public Good Alliance will have on effective governance for open digital ecosystems. 
And then lastly, on October 11th, we have a workshop on connecting open code with policymakers to development. Great. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to either myself or Ricardo. And thank you so much for joining us for this talk today.